I'm going to chat to you today uh, about a perspective, a perspective that may be a little bit pro provocative. You may find it a little bit troubling. Some of you may totally disagree, but it's one that's nevertheless driven me to start my company, so I suppose you could say I've already drunk the Kool-Aid. And the perspective I'm going to focus on is one that I learned from my grandfather, grandfather, who was an engineer. And during the course of his generation, he saw revolutionary changes in transportation, communication, medicine. He saw it take 75 years from the advent of the automobile to the industry consolidating into the big few to then totally disappearing almost from the United States to go over to now India. He saw 35 years for the industry of the television. Some of us are old enough to remember a black and white television. But for that industry to become an industry whereby instead of having one television in every home, we have multiple televisions to the industry completely disappearing from the United States. And he saw from the introduction of the semiconductor business only 20 years before it completely disappeared overseas. So from the point of view of which something is discovered until it becomes commoditized seems to be in a lifespan now of just a relative few number of years. And what all these have in common is, is velocity of change. As you've heard, that velocity, or let's say it another way, that, that rate of change is speeding up. So let's turn a moment for to transportation. And let's talk about it in regards to his lifetime. In 1909, my grandfather was woken up by his parents. He, they lived in Dover, just over the hill there. And he was taken down to see Louis Blériot, who had just flown over the English Channel. He flew 22 miles in 36 minutes. It was only 60 years later that my grandfather saw man's first step on the moon being beamed back in live black and white TV images. How remarkable that in his lifetime, transportation that has become routine, automobiles we do every day, and from a point of view of air travel, we now get to choose to go anywhere in the world that we want and do and see things hitherto that we never considered possible. I wonder what would happen if when my grandfather was standing at Louis Blériot's plane, if he said to Louis Blériot, you know, one day in my lifetime, I'll be able to go and get on an airplane and I'll be able to fly anywhere in the world and it may take me as long to go through security as it does flying on this plane. So back to my, my granddad. When I was eight, he said to me, watch out, Justin, in your lifetime, you're going to see things unimaginable. And they're going to happen faster than anybody can predict. The dizzying scale of innovation that we're seeing in nanotechnology is promoting change on a scale that is truly remarkable. The concept that we're able to tinker around with the very building blocks of nature, just like they're Lego blocks, to make things of incredible strength and with properties never before seen is literally changing the world before us. Physicist Richard Feynman was the first person to talk about nanotechnology in 1959. It was at a Christmas dinner talk. He had about 30 people sitting around the table. And he argued from what was known at the time. And at that time, a calculator was the size of a typewriter. And a computer was the size of a room. And he argued and explored the size limits set by physical laws. And he ended up arguing the possibility, rather the inevitability, of atom by atom construction. 
It seemed to Feynman at the time incredibly wasteful that we would go take a forest, we would cut it down, we would put it in a sawmill, we would create planks, and then we would go build a table, destroying our environment in the process. What an incredible waste, when really all you had to do was go get the building blocks of the universe, put them together like Lego blocks, click by click, and build a table literally from the bottom up. Anybody sitting at that Christmas dinner table must have thought Feynman was off his rocker. Certainly it was utterly ambitious. It was bizarre. But 50 years on from that dinner discussion at Christmas, what he described is literally what is probably going to save our world. This one. The one that we all depend for our very survival. The one in the face of the progress that we face every day, we are pushing to the breaking point. The seven billionth person has just been born into a world where today we use one and a half world's worth of resources in our insatiable need every year for more. What that means is what we destroy it takes the world a year and a half for every year that we use to try and replenish. By 2050, we're going to need two and a half planets worth of resources to support the 10 billion people that will be there. Now, the last time I checked, we live on only one of these planets. Turning our life-sustaining resources into waste faster than can be replenished puts us all in danger of overshoot, depleting the very resources that we all depend on for our daily survival. Global population growth is unforgiving, and global economic development is unrelenting and unforgiving. And we're ever more divided in this world about what it takes to solve our problems, despite knowing exactly what they are. Why is this? I remember in March of 2000, I read this in a paper. It was talking about the B-15 iceberg that had just broken away from the Ross Ice Shelf in Antarctica. And in the paper it said it was all part of a normal process. Just a little bit further down in the paper it said a loss that would normally take the ice shelf 50 to 100 years to replace. That same word normal now had two different, almost opposite meanings. If we bump into the B-15 iceberg when we leave here today, we're going to bump into something a thousand feet tall, 76 miles long, 17 miles wide, and it's going to weigh two gigatons. And I'm sorry, in my mind, there's nothing normal about that. And yet I think it's this tendency that we have as humans is to look at everything from a perspective of normal, no matter what it is, is one of the reasons we stop taking change that we really need to do. Only 90 days after this, arguably the greatest discovery of the last century occurred. It was the first sequencing of the human genome. This is the source code, if you like, that's in every single one of our cells. It's the instructions that make us who we are and what we are. And if you just take one cell's worth of this code, unwind it, it's about a meter long, and it's two nanometers wide. This instruction set makes us who we are, and it comes from something as small as that. And that made me wonder, what if we could look at radical innovation from the same perspective, 
try and find answers to our biggest problems in the smallest of places, where the difference between what is valuable and what is worthless is merely the additional subtraction of just a couple of atoms. So I started to go around the world to find the best and brightest I could at universities whose collective discoveries have the potential to take us there, and this is what became the core of the company that we start in Nano Holdings, so that we could turn their extraordinary ideas and instead stop burning up our planet and generate all the energy that we need, not centrally in vast plants polluting our world, but right where we are, cleanly, safely, and cheaply. That was our idea. So if you think about a space, I'd argue that we should think about the spaces in which we find ourselves all the time differently. In the middle of summer, we have a tremendous amount of light and heat coming into a room that we basically want to sit at about, I don't know, 22 degrees Celsius, and we need 80 lumens of light to do our work. That's what you actually need as a human. In the middle of summer, though, we get vast amounts more than that coming through windows that we then have to use a tremendous amount of energy to keep cool that space in summer. In winter, exactly the opposite is happening. It's cold outside, and all the heat that we're generating inside the room is trying to get out through the window. It would be really great if we could have exquisite control over that energy flow at all times. Well, it turns out one of the materials, a nanomaterial that's 100,000 times thinner than the width of a single hair on your head, and in some circumstances is 1,000 times more conductive than copper. Let me just stop a moment and think about that. Carbon, carbon nanotube, a thousand times more conductive than copper, also is totally transparent. When you think of carbon, you think of carbon black, it's black. Also happens to be very selective about infrared heat. So if I take this carbon nanotube that we make in a proprietary process, here we're taking graphite. We are vaporizing it with two high-intensity lasers. This is the only machine of its kind in the world. It's a university in Florida. And that green stream that comes out after the reaction, when it coalesces back into carbon, it co coalesces back into this chicken wire tubular structure. When you take that carbon and add it to a polymer, in its transparent state, it lets all light and heat through a window. And when it's colored state, it reflects it and any combination in between and in any color you like. It's not just theory. I have one. So our idea was, maybe you could go to every building in the world and just cut it out, put it on a window, and start to get exquisite control of what you do in the space. As we were developing this idea, and this is what happens when you go to universities, you, you just bump into other people and other scientists who are working on something and they don't quite know what they're working on and how it may apply to industry. This was a scientist uh, just down the corridor. And when we saw what he had, we thought, gosh, what would the world look like if you could turn off every light? How much energy would you be able to save? Well, to be able to do that, you'd have to see at night. And humans don't. This is the military's answer to seeing at night. It's about $10,000. It's about a 50% gross margin business. It weighs about two pounds. You have about 10 pounds of batteries around your belt. 
And I am told that after you wear these for about eight hours, that rest right on the bridge of your nose, you can get a really nice size headache going. This is our equivalent due to nanotechnology. I have one of them here. I was going to pass it around, but it cost $3 million to make the first one. <laughs> it's two pieces of glass and a thin nanofilm. I'll show you how it's made. It takes infrared that is widely available at night. Widely available. On two thin films, it converts it to visible light, firstly to an electron and then to visible light. And the complete device size is half a micron in thickness. So if I take a pencil and I make a decimal point like that, that's 300 microns. This is a very thin device. I'll just show it to you working. You can even probably tell the car that that key drives. That is taking light that we wouldn't see at night, black light, infrared, and converting it to an electron to the visible. What if you stopped it halfway in the process? I could firstly have it on glasses should I choose to see at night. That may sound weird to us, but our kids in a world where energy is 10 times more expensive may think nothing of putting on a cool pair of Oakleys to walk around at night seeing at night. But if we stopped it halfway through that process, I convert it, remember, infrared light to an electron to then visible. And I add it to my polymer with a carbon nanotube. This flexible device that's on a window could be on any surface, and this is an electron generator. It sort of makes you think differently about what you think a solar cell should look like. A solar cell can be any surface. That's a different world. Now, we talked about generating energy differently and where we would generate it. What we should think also about is where would we store energy. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the best storage device in the world. It was developed 150 years ago in France. And when I say the best, what I'm talking about is in terms of dollars per watt of electricity stored. There is nothing cheaper than this. They're better batteries, but they're a lot more expensive. So we really don't want to have a rack of these in our home. And so I drew on a napkin. I still have the napkin. I went down to the University of Texas at Dallas. I sat in a diner outside the airport with Bruce Gennade, who's the head of research at UT Dallas. And I said, what I want is e-box. And I want you to think of e-box as a refrigerator, but instead of storing milk, I want it to store electrons. Because my vision for power is that power should be distributed out to every single endpoint. My endpoint is my home or my office. Power out to the endpoint. And boy, that looks exactly like the computer business. That looks exactly like the telephony business. That looks exactly like the media business. We don't think of that, though, about power. But what if we did? And so we have now prototype number three. It has run now for two and a half years without failure. This e-box is connected to receive power from any source. And of course, for all the engineers in the room, the things that you'll see in that picture, they'll start ticking off in their head, inverters, circuits, all those things. Version three. It's even been submerged underwater by mistake, and it still came out working on the backside of that. It connects to any power input source. So it can be the grid, it can be a solar cell, it can be a wind turbine. It doesn't matter where the input comes from. And once it comes into the e-box, the e-box, like a computer, manages what you do with it and passes it out to devices.
The reason this is interesting, because in a lot of the world now, we're going over to differential pricing for electricity. At dinner last night, I found out that that's what you do here. We were targeting originally California. And the idea was, what if you started to buy electricity in the middle of the night, store it in e-box like milk, use it in the middle of the day by switching on and off the grid when you need or on and off a solar cell. And what you can see here is the savings just by deciding when to buy electricity smartly. If you add a simple solar cell of whatever format, you're starting to make significant savings just by knowing when to buy electricity. You're starting to see this in the cell phone business. There are services working now in Europe whereby at the minute your cell phone charge can be switched between different carriers by whichever one has the cheapest rate at that moment. And I believe exactly the same is going to happen on a global basis with regards to how we think about our energy. When we were in India, just before I left the last time, um, 600 million people's homes went off the grid as it fell over, and I went, ha ha, that was India. I'd expect that. If you had our e-box, I said very proudly, this wouldn't have happened. And it won't happen when you distribute power out to the endpoint. And of course, I went back to Connecticut, and exactly the same thing happened. And I'm told that you've had power outages here fairly recently too. This is something we don't escape because we are putting more devices onto our networks, our power grids, faster than most people in the world can build generation capacity. That trend is going to continue. So what we need is the ability to load level. When you combine these puzzle pieces and others around the world that other brilliant minds are thinking about, it starts to create the possibility and open the potential that if I've got energy, pure energy, stored in my basement and I don't need it, since half the world lives in urban environments and our houses never move in relation to each other, that if I don't need my electrons that are stored in my e-box, I can bring them back up to my window I can convert them back into light or into energy and beam them to your house. Gosh, that sounds awfully like Wi-Fi, whereby we share our network capacity. And if that's the case, the energy grid of tomorrow is no grid. And energy at the margin, so now I'm talking about an electron, Energy at the margin will be free. I think from where you all sit today, that seems a little bit far-fetched and impossible. Just as our parents and grandparents couldn't imagine in 1927, when AT&T inaugurated its first telephone call from New York to London, whereby a telephone call cost $75 for three minutes on a circuit built to handle one call that we and our children today on a laptop can call anybody in the world and talk forever for nothing, as my daughter does. But by accepting the extraordinary as normal, it means that it doesn't matter what is practical. It doesn't matter what is a pipe dream, and it doesn't matter what technologies are breakthroughs and which technologies just look simply good on paper. Because, you see, today's impossible that we all accept as normal is tomorrow's possible. And maybe the day after that, practical. So I'm going to show you what really happens in the lab at universities when you accept and embrace the possibility that impossible can happen before your eyes. There are a billion cars on the road. These are all primarily driven 
using gasoline. Gasoline is 30% efficient. And every scientist will stand up and say, fuel cells are 80 to 90% efficient. How many people here, please, show of hands, how many people here have their cars driven by a fuel cell? Can I have a show of hands? One enterprising lady. OK, so a fuel cell is very expensive. And the reason, one of the primary reasons that a fuel cell is expensive is because the cathode has a catalyst on it which is called platinum. Platinum is like gold. When you run a fuel cell, the platinum, if this is the cathode, the platinum would look like salt spread out over the table. And as I run my fuel cell, that platinum, the salt, is going to migrate to the center. It's going to get polluted by carbon monoxide. And apparently, what we're meant to do if we're driving one of these cars is every once in a while, we're going to take out our cathode with this platinum on it. We're going to swap it for another one. And somehow, we're going to reclaim this platinum back so that we can drive our car. And by the way, if we all do this, the world's platinum supply runs out in 15 years. One of the kids in the lab spotted this. And he said, OK, this is carbon, dirt cheap carbon, admittedly secret carbon that we've done something to it. But it's a thousand times more conductive than copper. Could I borrow, could I borrow this plastic, which is this, with the carbon on it? And I'm going to take it and I'm going to put it right where the cathode is. And I'm going to take out that platinum and I'm going to put carbon in instead. And I'm going to fire up my fuel cell and see what happened. I don't know why he thought like this, but he did. What he saw was a real surprise. Don't worry about the axis if you just accept that for a moment. Look at the colors. The red color is platinum. The other colors are just different thicknesses of this film. Ladies and gentlemen, what you're seeing is the reactivity of carbon in a certain format is more reactive than platinum. The story doesn't stop. Because then he thought, well, OK, I know what we do when we want to split water, because splitting water gives me hydrogen. And anybody who thinks about what the world's future energy source is going to be, everybody says hydrogen. But I've got a problem with hydrogen. If I make hydrogen, I've got to somehow ship it to where you are, or I've got to put it down a pipe to a building, through a network, all over town, and somebody always pops up in a room and says, but hang about, if I do that with hydrogen, I get a little leak and the hydrogen comes out, boom, I've just lost the whole of downtown. I don't really want a hydrogen economy. Added to the fact, making hydrogen from electrolysis of water, because I'm using platinum, is incredibly expensive. So. Why bother to go down this path, particularly when every chemistry student at university reads from a textbook like this, whereby it says, if you look in the red box, what it's saying is this overpotential, what's the fancy word for how much electricity you need to split water, is so great, and in the presence of carbon, you shouldn't do it. In fact, it says you should use carbon as a structural support on which, and you read further down, it says you use platinum or palladium. This is what all our kids are taught at university. And at the macro scale, the world that we live in, this is 100% correct. At the nano scale, this is 100% wrong. And I'm going to show it to you. I'll stop the uh, video here before, so I can just explain what you're seeing. These are two carbon electrodes, pennies by the ton carbon. This is water. It could be salt water. It could be dirty water. It doesn't matter what it is. And now I'm going to put an electric charge through. I want you to focus your eyes on these two, because one electrode, they're, they're carbon. We have changed the structure of carbon ever so slightly. And we all now run the reaction. Common carbon on the right is making a hydrogen. For every gram of carbon we're using, we're making 176 liters of hydrogen per hour. This is in fundamental contradiction to what you learn in a chemistry book at university today. You're seeing what people historically have said is impossible. But the impossible actually happens 
when you understand changing the building blocks of the universe makes things like this happen. So let me put the pieces together for you. The world is built of periodic table of elements. What I've just described should not be a surprise. We know what one or two combinations of periodic table of elements, when mixed together, make. When you look at combinations greater than two, you know next to nothing about what they make. I would argue that the age of discovery that we think we've gone through is nothing compared to what's about to occur when you get exquisite control over the possible combinations that are coming. So another part of our company is a computational design side. You can't go through whatever that number of possible combinations is in the lab, mixing and matching to see what might happen. The only way you can solve this is by using massive computer power. And what we do in one side of our business is we just sift through endless possible combinations looking for targets. A company came to us talking about this problem. If I take any dirt particle into a jet turbine, it's coming in 500 miles an hour, it's going to ping the turbine blades. And the turbine blades, titanium alloy, expensive stuff, are going to crack. And that crack is going to propagate through the turbine blade, and that's everything about the operating cost of an aircraft. Could you, was the question, design, purpose design, a new material that could be better than a titanium alloy? By the way, it's about 600 bucks to coat a titanium blade on a turbine in an aircraft. If you describe that problem to a computer, it breaks that problem down into a set of mathematical equations that can then go to the periodic table of elements and say, don't bother looking in all the places other than those two red boxes. That's the only likely place that you're going to find something new. It'll also come back and give you a recipe book, just like making cookies, and say all the different things that you could go mix and match in the right kind of proportions. To, and it'll even tell you what crystalline structure you're after. All theory at the moment but theory can be broken into practice very, very rapidly. This is the material that the industry uses on every turbine blade that you and I fly on a plane. These five new molecules are all better. They cost $30 a coating, as opposed to the many hundreds of dollars. Start to finish of this whole process was three months. So I'd ask you to think about your industry. If you say, I need a material that, please don't think it's going to take decades to find it. Start thinking about problem sets that you should think about, what do I want as opposed to what can't I have? If we solve our challenges this way, you could start to put the picture together of how our world might look differently. So our house now, or our office, is completely independent. It has an e-box that is storing electrons that it makes or decides where it gets made from either my solar cell. I've gone off to the office. I don't need power at the moment. My e-box goes and turns on my hydrogen generator. My hydrogen generator is not pumping hydrogen all over the world. It's just moving it from a bucket just by my back door, hydrolyzing it and putting it in a tank under the ground, storing it not under pressure because I don't care about size. It just sits there until I come home, and then I pump it back through a dirt cheap fuel cell that doesn't have to have platinum in it because it's now made of carbon. What does the world look like when we do this all over the place? Byproduct of a fuel cell is water. We've just changed how you should think about what sustainability means. And if we solve that, we also then solve one of the perplexing problems that we all face, which is water. Two thirds of the world are going to be under water stress in 13 years. And that's just around the corner. Our, our central government solutions to this is desalination. It's not a problem particularly for Canada, but I can tell you the middle band of the world 
They think about this all the time. In the Middle East, in Bahrain, they have five days' supply of water on hand. When water runs out, people have to move, and they're going to move across other people's front yards. And when that happens, other people get really shirty. So we need other alternatives rather than mass migration of human population across other people's front yards. $19 trillion isn't the answer. And by the way, even if we had $19 trillion to desalinate the world, to run those pumps will take twice the world's supply of oil. So all that says it's not happening except for a few lucky of us. Out of Chennai in India is this remarkable device. It's a set of nanomaterials that look like lock and keys that are able to, at the molecular scale, extract, not filter, extract like a magnet particles that you don't want to drink. There's no such thing as drinking just a little bit of virus. You've got to get it all out. Nanomaterials, in this case, help you know that your water is completely safe, no matter where it's sourced. And by the way, the source for this table was a puddle just outside the lab in Chennai. And I can promise you, none of us in this room would ever drink that water. Now, I've talked a lot about velocity, this rate of change, at some length. And I want to leave you with some closing thoughts, and what better than to go boldly out into space. While it took my granddad a scant 60 years to see Blerio to man on the moon, it only took another eight years after seeing man walk on the moon for NASA to launch two of these, the Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 spacecraft. And since their launch in 1977, they visited the largest planets in our solar system and provided a spectacular view of our local neighborhood. They're, they're meant to function till at least 2020. They've long gone out of our solar system. They're now into, the, into, into space between our galaxy and another one. Um, and, they, and they're hoped one day, many millions of years from now, to be found by somebody else, I suppose. And on the side of these things, there's a gramophone record. And I'm told that if you play this gramophone record, it says, good day, eh? A map has also been supplied on the side of this, which, which tells anyone that finds it where we are and when we are. One of the remarkable things about this craft is its speed. Now, it's going about 35,500 miles per hour. Now, the fastest a human has ever traveled is in the space journey from the Earth to the Moon, and that took about three days. This takes seven hours to cover the same distance. Now, let's go back to the turn of the last century and imagine us all sitting in a room, and I was speaking to a group of industrials like you, and I was going to say, you know, in 70-odd years, this is the start of the automobile, by the way, in 70-odd years, I'm going to build a craft that looks like this. It's going to fly at 35,500 miles an hour, and we're going to send it out into interstellar stellar space to go say to somebody, hi, just how crazy do you think I would have been? Uh, by the way, back then, um, at the start of the automobile, one of the arguments as to about why the automobile would not go faster than 25 miles an hour is because was the pervasive belief that above that speed, the human body would literally shake apart. We live in a unique neighborhood, a neighborhood which has provided building blocks of the universe that we're only just beginning to harness. We live in a neighborhood where our sun provides us every moment of every day, 10,000 times the world's energy needs. I'll give you some idea of what that amount of energy is. I want you to imagine a couple of engineers got together out of this room and figured out how to build an ice road from here to the sun. And the ice road is two miles wide, one mile deep. And we get on this road and we drive to the sun. 168 years later, 
no pee break, no dinner, no sleeping, you'd get to the sun. The sun would melt that ice bridge, 168 years long, two miles wide, one mile deep, in one second. Our attempts at radical energy innovation are still in its baby steps. Change is a powerful thing, and I would urge the great minds in this room to embrace a commitment to be a part of change like that as you look at your business. But most importantly, to not be timid. He did not say, I have a plan. He did not say, what he said, thank you. <laughs>